And we're going to talk about the doctrine of miracles. We're going to talk about miracles tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus, and I'm so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you for being our wonderful, wonderful Savior. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll fill me with your power during this time. Holy Spirit, give me the mind of Christ as well. I want to say exactly what you once said. And then I pray for every person here and those who are watching online. Give us all ears to hear, a heart to receive and a mind to comprehend. If anybody among us needs to be saved or needs to be baptized, Lord, help them to make those important decisions tonight. And then for all of us, Lord, please touch our hearts and we'll give you the glory for what you'll do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, miracles, miracles. First of all, point number one, the word miracle or plural appears in 37 verses in the Bible, five of them, in the Old Testament, and 32 of them in the New Testament. And we're going to look at all five passages, I, I believe all five, or at least four of the five, in the Old Testament tonight. But uh, 37 times the word miracle, or plural, appears in the Bible. Now, number two, miracle defined. The two definitions of the word miracle I'd like to give to you tonight is this. Literally, it is a wonder or wonderful thing, but appropriately. Then, number two, in theology, an event or effect contrary to the established constitution and course of things or a deviation from the known laws of nature, it is a supernatural event. Okay, so it is a wonder or something that is a wonderful thing. And then secondly, it is a supernatural event. Okay, um, birth of a baby, that to me is a miracle. Uh, that's something that is wonderful, and it is something that is, uh, you know, it's just amazing how it all happens. I mean, I know science and, and, uh, and uh, uh, scientists and doctors and stuff, they can, you know, well, this is why this happens this way and stuff. But, but I do believe the birth of a child is an act of God, and it is a wonderful thing. And, and to that degree, uh, it is a miracle. Now, miracle, though, when we think of the word miracle, Oftentimes, we think of something that would be like supernatural. You know, I think of the parting of the Red Sea when the, when the children of Israel walked across on dry ground. I think of when Jesus fed 5,000 men besides women and children, probably 15 to 20,000 people with five pieces of, of bread and two small pieces of fish. And he multiplied it. And, and that's something supernatural. Um, the resurrection from the dead, again, that is a supernatural event. So when I think of the word miracles, I think of something that is a wonder or a wonderful thing, or it is something that is supernatural. There are those who, who teach that there was an age given to miracles, and that's just simply not true. Miracles were performed all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. Miracles were performed during the time of Christ when he was on earth in the four gospels. And then miracles were performed all throughout the New Testament. Why would we think that their miracles have ceased or that we're no longer in the age of miracles? There, there are preachers and there are theologians and even Christians who are more doom and gloom type Christians where they call this the Laodicean age and they say this is the age of apostasy and there's no miracles and all of this stuff. I don't believe any of that to be true. I believe the, the same miracle working God that worked miracles throughout the Old Testament during the time that Christ was on earth and during the early uh, time of the church as is stated in the New Testament books, he's still alive today and miracles happen today and they can continue to happen. So just so that you understand, there is no defined age of miracles that are listed in the Bible. Uh, miracles can happen at any age, amen? And so it's, it's for us today in 2023. All right, now let's get to some direct references and some applications. Number three, fill in the blanks as we go. God performs miracles to show the world who he is. God performs 
miracles to show the world who he is. In Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Now, that word god is the lowercase g. And, um, and so God was saying, Moses, Pharaoh is going to look at you like, like you're a god. And uh, even though Moses was just a man, all right? Let's continue. Verse 2. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old and Aaron fourscore and three years old. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83. Aaron was his older brother. All right, let's continue. When they spake unto Pharaoh, and the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, when and Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. All right. The word miracle in verse 9 of Exodus chapter 7, this is the first time that the word miracle is mentioned in the scriptures. And God says, I'm going to perform, I'm going to let you, Moses, perform a miracle. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that rod of yours. You're going to cast it to the ground. It's going to turn into a serpent. And Pharaoh's going to know that I'm God. Now, verse number five is the reason that God is going to do all these miracles in front of Pharaoh and Egypt. It says, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. All right, so um, God was saying, I'm gonna do these miracles and Moses, you're gonna perform these miracles in front of Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. Here's why, for the purpose of them knowing that I am the Lord, I am God. And so God performs miracles to show the world who he is. You know, it's so silly, it's so silly that people actually think that God is not real. It's just silly. I mean, you, you cannot come up with a logical reason for all of this, the whole world, for life. People that wanna, you know, people that are so-called educated, they say, well, evolution is the reason. Yeah, you ever thought about evolution? I mean, really seriously sat down and thought about the belief of evolution. You know, you've heard me say this many times. Nothing, there was, there was a time that there was nothing and it exploded. Now, how does that make logical sense? How does nothing explode? First of all, what caused the explosion? Second of all, what was it that was actually exploding? Nothing exploded. And then from that explosion became matter and that matter went far out in the stretches of the universe and then it became orderly. Now, anybody that knows anything about science, if you're gonna prove a, a theory, you know, you've gotta be able to substantiate uh, what the theory is promoting. So what, what I would recommend, don't do this at home, uh, unless you're a professional, uh, take something and blow it up 100 times in a row. And after you blow it up 100 times, every single time document it, did it create order or disorder? Well, if you take an object and blow it up, it's always going to create disorder. But evolution's premise is that nothing exploded and it became matter. And from the explosion became order and life and what we have now on planet Earth. It's just illogical. Every once in a while, God has to show himself, flex his muscles, and show himself through miracles. That, hey, I'm here. I'm real. Don't, don't denounce me. Don't deny me. I exist. And one of the things that God does 
is he shows to mankind that does not believe in him that he does exist through miracles. Number four, never dismiss or disregard the miracles of God. Never dismiss or disregard the miracles of God. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 20 through 24, the Bible says, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these 10 times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully him will i bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it now in this particular passage okay there were 10 miracles that god performed openly for all the egyptians to see and then the last miracle was obviously the passover and um and so god brought all of the the two to three million hebrews out of egypt they're in the wilderness they're going to the promised land. But here's what many of those Hebrews did. They doubted whether or not God would take care of them. They doubted whether or not he would feed them, give them water, and protect them while they were in the wilderness. They came to the door of the promised land, if you please, where the Jordan River was. They sent 12 spies into the land, the land of Canaan, that God wanted to give them. For 40 days, they came back, 10 spies said thumbs down. We can't do this. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, they said, thumbs up. We can do this. God, God brought us out of Egypt. He'll bring us into the promised land. The nation of Israel, or before they were a nation, but the Hebrew people, they said, no, we're not going. God ain't going to do this for us. There, there's no way we're all going to die. Let's go back to Egypt. And God said, 10 times, you've doubted whether or not I could take care of you. Even though all the miracles that I did for you while you were in Egypt and brought you out of Egypt, you still doubt me. You disregard my abilities. And obviously he said, none of you are gonna go in the promised land because of it. Then in Hebrews chapter two, in the New Testament, verses one through four, the Bible says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, look at verse three very carefully now, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Okay, now watch this carefully. In verse number number three, God says, how shall we, talking about us in the church, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? This is not necessarily talking about neglecting God's salvation from hell. This is talking about God saving us all throughout life, all of mankind, the children of Israel, the early church, every miracle that he's done. God says, look, if, if you see all, it says in verse uh, one, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And verse two talks about the words spoken. And, uh, and so God says, look, all the miracles I perform, it's, it's all written in the Bible. You know everything that I've ever done. God says, how shall you escape? if you neglect so great salvation. You see, one of the things that we've got to understand is when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they tempted God and denied him and disregarded his miracles, they had no book of, you know, they had no Bible to read, to reference what had happened. You and I do. You and I have the story of, of Genesis and Exodus and the Hebrew people that were leaving the Egypt and go to the promised land through the means of the wilderness. You and I have all the miracles that God did for the, for the, for the early church in the book of Acts. And we, and we know all that God's capable of doing. And God says, it's gonna be heavy on us 
if we dismiss and disregard the miracles that God is capable of performing. Because we have an entire book. Yeah, you know, I've often said, you know, what Job went through with his trials, you know, and, and sufferings and all that he went through. He had no book of Job to reference. But when you and I go through trials and sufferings, we have the book of Job to reference. So there's much more accountability for us on our part. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna escape if we neglect so great salvation that God's given to us. So here's the thing about God. He's a miracle working God. Number four, never dismiss or disregard the miracles of God. And uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to make sure that we understand all that God's capable of doing. And we need to live the life that God has called us to live, trusting in this miracle working God that we serve. Amen? Let's not disregard or dismiss what he's capable of doing. Number five, I like this point. It is our responsibility to pass on to the next generation what kind of God we have. It is our responsibility to pass on to the next generation what kind of God we have. You know, I'm very concerned about the future church in America. So few children, so few teenagers are being raised in church these days. So few of them go to church. And, and by the way, pastors' families are not, you know, we're not, uh, we're not immune to this. I think it's, in, it's all of this younger generation. Do you realize that in the last, uh, I think it's 60 or 80 years, there are fewer people attending church in America today than there were 80 years ago? And do you realize how many more millions of people have been born and the population of America has increased a lot, but yet church attendance has not increased? We are in danger of the church becoming insignificant in our society. You remember uh, centuries ago, back in the uh, 1700s and 1800s and maybe even the early 1900s, Europe, are you listening? Europe was on fire for God. And they had revivals over there. D.L. Moody would preach in England. Charles Spurgeon would preach in England. And it was revival center in Europe. They had the great Welsh revival. I think it was 1904, if I remember correctly, the year. And now in Europe, there's hardly any revival there at all when it comes to God and, and, and churches. I mean, it's hard to see anybody excited about God or any church excited about God in Europe. And here's the thing, that's what's gonna happen to America if we don't start changing. The next generation, there'll be nothing here. There'll be so few churches and so few signs of God's miraculous power, such little bit of revival. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. We, we can fix the problem, but here's what we gotta do. Our children, our young people have to know that God is real. He's a miracle working God and he is alive and he loves us and he cares for us. And if we don't pass that knowledge on to the next generation, what's gonna happen to churches? One by one all over America, they're just gonna fold. As the older people die off, where are the younger people that are gonna take their place? It's just not common right now in America. And here's why. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse one. It says, therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments alway. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles, and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt, and the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses and their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath, hath destroyed them unto this day, and what he did unto you in the wilderness until ye came into this place, and what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their households and their tents and all their, the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel, but your eyes 
have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whither ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them. Now listen to this very carefully. He said right here in a verse, verse number, number two, it says, your children have not known, they haven't heard my words, they've not known, they haven't seen all my miracles and all my acts, which I did. And he was saying, you need to tell them. Look at Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. It says, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears under the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them know to, known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. You see, in this passage of scripture, in Psalm 78, in verse 4, it says, we will not hide them from their children. It says, showing to the generation to come the praises of God. It says in verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. Listen to this carefully. It is our responsibility to pass on to the next generation how great God is, how great it is to be a Christian, how wonderful the Christian life is, church is. You know, we live in a day and age that people can, you know, take church or leave it. Like, who cares? I mean, if I got time, I'll go. If not, I'll stay home and watch the Broncos. You know, I mean, that's our attitude in our culture. Like, we don't really value the Bible. We don't value church and the things of God. And part of the reason was the generation before us, even though they went to church more faithful than we are, Somehow they didn't pass that on to us. And, and that's why America has less in church today than the generation before us, even though the population has exploded by millions. What's going to happen in 2040, in 2060, in 2080, if the Lord doesn't come back? What's, what's America going to look like? I'm afraid it's going to look a lot like what Europe is today. Not much belief in God, not much revival, not many churches. You know, I, in all of England, I think the largest independent Baptist church in the country of England is not even running 200 in attendance. I'm talking about the entire country. The entire country. Now, that, again, Charles Spurgeon, when he was alive, they were running like 5,000 every single Sunday. D.L. Moody, he would have evangelistic crusades in England, and it would be tens of thousands of people that would show up to the evangelistic crusades, and so many people are getting saved and getting right with God. But here's the thing. If we do not pass that on to the next generation, then we're, the next generation isn't going to know. They're not going to believe. You know, I think there's nothing wrong with parents raising their children in church. I'm not saying that every child that's raised in church is going to turn out for God. But I'm saying this, parents, you have a responsibility to teach your children the ways of God. You have a responsibility to teach them to come to church and to be faithful to church, to pray, to read their Bible. It's our responsibility. You know, it's so funny how I, I've talked to parents over the years. You know, I've been pastoring this church now for this is my 30th year pastoring this church. How, how, how uh, parents have said, well, I don't want to force religion on my kids. Wait a second. You'll force them to go to school. You'll force them when they're young to eat their vegetables. 
You'll force them to do chores. You'll force them to go to bed at a certain time. You'll force them to behave while they live in your house, but you won't force them to go to church. You see, the idea is this, the devil gets in our head and, we, and says, well, you can't really make someone believe. No, you can't. You can't make anybody believe, but you can make them obey you, your children, while they live in your house. I, I gotta tell you, a personal testimony. My mom did not take me to church that I can remember the first 12 years of my life. When I was a seventh grader, my mom got religion. <laughs> she got, she was interested in going to church. Now, I'm 12 years of age. I'm in seventh grade. My entire life, I was not raised in church. But then my mom said, we're going. And when my mom said, we're going, she said, son, you got no, you, you got no choice in the matter. Every time I go, you go. When did my mom go? Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, church functions, church activities, didn't matter. Whenever the church doors was open, my mama went. And my mom made me go with her too. Now watch this. 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I would sit there like this. I was looking at my watch. When's it going to be over so I can go home? I did not enjoy myself. I did not want to be there. You say, why were you there? Because there's one thing I feared. I feared mama. My mom was the type of mom that said, son, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. You better do what I say. <laughs> so I went to church because I knew what was best for me. I didn't fear God, but I sure did fear mama. <laughs> and so I would go mess with her, right? But when I was there, it was just five years. 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then all of a sudden, God got a hold of my heart my senior year of high school when I was 17. And I gave my life to God. God called me to be a preacher. I went off to Bible college. I came here in 1994, started this church. But why did God speak to me? You ready for this? Because my mom raised me in church. And when the time was right, I opened my heart to God. You see, it's okay, parents, if you bring your kids to church and they don't want to come. If they live in your house, they need to obey you. And I don't care if they're adults. My five sons know when they live in my house, if they do. I've only got one son that lives in my house right now. And I said, if you're not working, you have to be in church. And every one of my boys know that if they ever come back home to live in my house, I've got a rule. Whenever we go to church, we go to church as a family. The only exception is if, you know, they're working the job during a specific church service, and then they'll come. But other than that, they come. And, and, and that's, you know, see now, how, you know, do all the kids that you, you know, are they all living for God on their own? No. But it's my responsibility to teach them the ways of the Lord. If I don't teach them the ways of the Lord, they ain't going to live for God ever. There is a verse in the book of Proverbs that kind of means a little bit to me more now. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Now listen carefully. If you don't train up your child in the way he should go, how is he ever going to come back home if he ever gets away? You've got to train them up in the way they should go. And the way they should go is with God. The way they should go is with prayer and Bible. The way they should go is with church. Now, a lot of children, they get away from it for a while when they become adults. Now, they shouldn't. I didn't. I turned 18, and I just went right off to Bible college. So not every child has to get away, but if they do get away, they'll come back to what they were taught if you teach them right. We've got to show the generation to come the praises of God. Number six, God withholds miracles because of our disobedience and evil. God withholds miracles because of our disobedience and evil. Look at Judges chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. Judges chapter 6. Are you with me? Look at verse 1. And the children of Israel, look what it says, underline this, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so this is God's people. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord, here's the response, delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. 
And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the, made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now, all of this is because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, look at verse 7. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and, div uh, and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you dwell. Now look what it says. But, underline this, ye have not obeyed my voice. So in verse 1, it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. In verse 10, it says they didn't obey God's voice. Verse 11, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Oprah that pertaineth unto Joash and Abizarite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, now watch this, the Bible says the angel said the Lord is with you, Gideon. And Gideon responded and said, if the Lord be with us. You see the difference there? Ready? Why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianites. And the, now watch this. Why did the Lord forsake them? Why did the Lord deliver them to the hand of the Midianites? Are you listening? Because of two things, right? Number one, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Number two, they didn't obey his voice. But here's Gideon. He's a good man, a godly man. Now watch this. Look at verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him, Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Now watch this. Gideon said to God, If you're really for us, where's all your miracles? You know what he was saying? My miracles were not here because of the evil of the children of Israel and their disobedience. But he said, Gideon, I'm coming to you because you'll obey me and you won't do evil. And through you, you're going to lead the children of Israel from the Midianites out from their oppression. And I will deliver the Midianites into your hand and I'll perform miracles because you, Gideon, are going to be the catalyst that gets Israel to obey God. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Why is it that God does withholds miracles from a people like us in 2023? It's because of our evil and it's because of our disobedience. But it just takes one man like Gideon to rise up and say, let's get back, back to God. Let's start obeying him again. Let's put away this evil from among us. I'm afraid America has a lot of work to do to get the evil out of our society. You have to be completely blind. You have to be completely ignorant of the Bible if you think America is not evil right now. I mean, just look at the millions and millions and millions and millions of babies that have been aborted. Millions upon millions upon millions of innocent blood that has been shed. And the Bible says God will not pardon the shedding of innocent blood. He won't do it. He won't do it. Look at how evil is glorified in Hollywood. Look at internet pornography. Look at um, abomination or abominable 
lifestyles that is so promoted in our culture today. Like everybody wants to sleep with whatever and whoever they want. And, and the Bible says some of that is wicked. It's an abomination. And yet we're promoting it. We're encouraging it. We're lifting it up. And then, and then not only is evil present in America, we're not obeying God as a country. We don't go to church like we should. We don't love our neighbors like we should. We're not exemplifying Christ like we should. We live in a society now that the general consensus of our contemporary world is do whatever makes you feel good. Do whatever you want. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do what you want. And the Bible tells us we have a heart that is wicked and deceitful above all things. We should not follow our heart. We should guide our heart to love the Lord and to live for him. That's what we need to do. Where be all his miracles? Let's look in the mirror, America. Let's see how much evil we allow and how much disobedience of God that we're doing. And if we just simply fix that, if we get the evil out of our society and start obeying God again, the miracles will come back. Number six, God withholds miracles because of our disobedience and evil. Number seven, a hard heart prevents us from seeing miracles from God. A hard heart prevents us from seeing miracles of God. In Mark chapter 6, verse 47, and when, the, when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, talking about Jesus. And that's a miracle, by the way. And would have passed by them, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they, saw, they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Now watch this, verse 52. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, besides women and children, with five pieces of fish, uh, five pieces of bread, and two pieces of fish. And they got in a boat at the end of the day, and sailed across the sea, and the storm came, and Jesus walked on water to come out to them. And guess what they did? They didn't see. They didn't see that it was Jesus. They were sore afraid. They were, they were terrified. They were distressed. Oh, my, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And yet Jesus says, hey, it's me. And they're like, it's you? Yes, it's me. And he said, why, didn't, why, why are you so fearful? And it's because their heart got hard. In other words, they weren't tender-hearted. They had a hard heart. You know how you can tell someone has a hard heart? It usually shows on their face. They're usually. You know, you can just as easily smile as you do get mad. But the condition of your heart, it reveals our countenance. And I'm just telling you something right now. If we develop a hard heart, we can't see what God's doing in our life. We can't see the miracles. We get bitter and angry and have a hard heart. And it's like, yeah, God's not real. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me. And, and all this bitterness and anger and a hard heart, we can't see what God's doing in our lives. Don't ever allow your heart to get hard. Always have a tender heart towards God. Number eight, no man can do miracles for God and not be on God's side. No man can do miracles for God and not be on God's side. In Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 40, it says, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not with us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part." So here's what, God's, here's what Jesus is saying. No man can do a miracle for God on God's behalf and not be with God or can't be against God. In other words, if, if someone's going to do something for God, if they don't follow us, it's okay. He says, if they're on his side, 
then he can do miracles for God. So here's what this means. The devil ain't going to do miracles for God. Are you listening? The devil doesn't do miracles for God. So if there's a miracle for God being done, it cannot be from someone who's not on God's side. So here's what this admonition is. You better make sure you're always on God's side. Hey, you know how you can tell if you're on God's side? A couple of ways, but here's one way. How do you vote during elections? How do you vote? Well, you don't vote. Okay, that's fine. How do you vote? Do you vote for people who are against God because they'll give you more money? They'll give you free education, free health care, free this, free that, free this, free that, free that. Oh, let's vote for them. But what, how do they feel about God? Are they God haters? Are they, are they passing laws that, that murder our babies while they're in their mother's womb? I mean, do they kick God out of the public school? Do they kick God and the Ten Commandments out of the courts of our society? Are they, are they wanting God to be annihilated in our society? Why are we voting for them if we're Christians? If we're Christians, we need to be on God's side. Vote for people that are for God, not for our pocketbook, not for free food or free housing or free education or free health care. All that free stuff, by the way, is never free. One of the biggest lies that people have believed in society is when a politician opens his mouth and says, you vote for me, you'll get free this, that, or the other. There is nothing free. Someone has to pay for it. You know what the politicians are telling you? You don't have to pay for it. Someone else will. You say the government will. Let me ask you a question. Where does the government get its money? Well, they print their own money. I know that. <laughs> they get it from taxes. Rob from the rich to give to the poor. That's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. You don't rob from someone who has something and then give it to someone who has nothing. That's not the solution to the problem. But, you know, how do you vote? I know we don't have election. I mean, we have, we have the ballots this, this November, um, this, this month, but it's not for voting people into office. Next, next November is. But you know what? I'm going to spend my whole life on God's side. I'm just telling you right now. I'm for God. I'm on his side. I, I don't ever want to be against God. I'm, I'm one of his children. He saved me. Why would I ever be against him? I'm never going to be against him. And when you're on God's side, you can see miracles from God in your life. Number nine, many have to see miracles in order to believe. Many have to see miracles in order to believe. John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, the Bible says, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. John chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Look at verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Now, what's Jesus' response to all of this? Look at John chapter 20, verses 27 through 29. Then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. What, what do we refer to Thomas as? Doubting Thomas, right? Because he doubted whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, right? So Jesus said to Thomas, why don't you come take your hand? Look what it says. Uh, reach hither thy hand, um, uh, finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. So how did Thomas respond? And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, my God. So he did believe, right? After he saw for himself that Jesus was risen. Now look what Jesus said, verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, Thou hast believed, ready? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You see, some people in our society, they won't believe in God unless they see a miracle. You know what God says? 
you will be blessed if you believe and you don't need a miracle to believe. You see, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus rose from the dead and met the disciples. And the disciples came and said, the Lord's alive. He goes, I will not believe unless I take my hand and thrust it in his, uh, in his side and see the holes in his hand. I'm not going to believe unless I see it. And so then Jesus showed up and said, you see me now, Thomas? He said, yeah. He goes, I believe now. He goes, well, good. I'm glad you believe. He says, but I'm going to tell you something. Blessed are those who don't see, but they believe anyway. I don't want to be a Christian that only believes that God loves me if I see him love me, I want to believe God loves me because the Bible says so. I don't want to be a Christian that says, I'll believe that you exist, God, if I see a miracle. No, I want to be a Christian that says, I believe you exist, God, because the Bible says you do. I don't need to see a miracle to believe, but many people do. And by the way, that's okay that they believe, but... If they stop seeing miracles, they usually fall away. They usually do. Number 10, miracles validate that God is working and is present. Miracles validate that God is working and is present. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, it, the Bible says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it now Peter was speaking to the the, the people of Israel that had Jesus crucified and he said, ye men of Israel, he said, verse 22, hear these words. Jesus was approved of God because of the miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. He says that was validation that Jesus was legitimate. And all I can say is this, miracles, when God performs a miracle, it validates that God is working and that God is present. Number 11. Miracles of God are undeniable. Miracles of God are undeniable. Acts chapter 4, verse 16. I'm talking about when people see the miracle, okay? We're not talking about, you know, 2,000 years ago, you know, we heard there was a miracle that took place. People can deny that. I'm talking about when you see a miracle in, your, in the flesh, when you see it with your eyes. Look what it says. In Acts 4, verse 16, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. There was a crippled man that was begging for alms. Alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And Peter, we know he was a Baptist because he looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> I ain't got no money. That's what he was saying. He said, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he stood up and he walked and he leapt and he was praising God. Everybody saw it. And so these men who did not believe in Jesus, they were angry at the apostles for preaching Jesus Christ to the people. Here's what they said. We got to be careful how we treat them because this notable miracle was done. All Israel saw it and we can't deny it. This man was crippled. And a miracle took place, and now he's walking and leaping and praising God. We can't deny it. So when you see a miracle take place in your life, when you witness it, it is undeniable. Number 12, being full of faith and the power of God is a prerequisite to doing the miraculous. Being full of faith and the power of God is a prerequisite to doing the miraculous. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. If you would like to be like these people in the Bible that, that it's referenced, they did miracles for God. Listen this carefully. You got to be full of faith and full of power, the power of God. You've got to be. You're not going to do miracles for God in your own flesh. And you're not going to be doing miracles for God if you just constantly doubt. 
Where's God? I never see God. I don't know if this is real. I don't know if the Bible's true. Well, as long as you doubt, it's going to prevent you from performing miracles or being a part of miracles. But it says about Stephen, he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Why? It says he was full of faith and power. That, that word power is talking about the power of God. So if you want to see miracles in your life and do miracles for God, you've got to be full of faith and the power of God. Number 13, when miracles happen, people have joy. When miracles happen, people have joy. Look at Acts 8, verses 5 through 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and, and that were lame were healed. Watch this. And there was great joy in that city. When miracles happen, people have joy. That's what happens. That's what happens. You say, how can I get more joy in my life? Well, try to get around some miracles of God. Be a church where miracles can take place. Be full of faith and full of power of God and live your life for God and you'll see miracles. It'll produce joy. Number 14, God gives special miracles to devoted soul winners. God gives special miracles to devoted soul winners. Look what it says in Acts 19, verses 10 and 11. And this continued by the space of two years, ready? So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. There was no person alive at this time that was a greater soul winner than Paul the Apostle. Do you see what it says here in verse 10? All they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. All of them. It doesn't say everybody got saved, but every single person in Asia, every person heard about Jesus. Why? Because Paul the apostle was an absolute devoted soul winner. And he went everywhere telling people about Jesus. Door to door, house to house, public places, everywhere. This is real important. When you get devoted to seeing lost people get saved, God will give you an opportunity to have special miracles. I believe that with all my heart. Number 15, we're almost done. Two points and we're done. Number 15, God gives miracles to his church if engaged in his kingdom. God gives miracles to his church if engaged in his kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31, it says, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, look what it says, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? He's, the answer is no, it's a rhetorical question. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Now listen carefully. What does it say there in verse number 28? God hath set some in the what? Verse 28. And God hath set some in the church. You want to see more miracles in your life? You better get to a church that's engaged in his kingdom. The less we spend time at church, the less miracles we're going to see. Church is the place where God ordained miracles to take place. And that's why church, one of the reasons why church should be very important in our lives. Number 16 and last, beware not to be deceived by miracles of the devil. Beware not to be deceived by miracles of the devil. The last passage we're going to read, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 18. We're going to read the whole chapter. Now, listen, this is talking about future events, right? But let's just see what it says about these future events. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, 
and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that's the devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This is talking about the reviving of the Roman Empire. That's what this is talking about. The one world order, the League of Nations or uh, whatever, you know, that's trying to get formed in, in the world today. That's what, that's what this is referring to. So this is a future event, not very much down the road, I don't believe. But it's talking about this government and there's going to be one ruler, a beast. I believe personally, I, I believe it's Judas Iscariot come back you know, from the dead. I believe that in my heart because it says that he saw this beast rise up out of the sea. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, let's, in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and a deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's basically three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in, in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given over him. Uh, uh, given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. We're talking about the Antichrist, of course, whose names are not written in the book of, of, of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hear, uh, excuse me, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein ready to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth, here's verse 13, he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understandeth, uh, hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. That's six, six, six. But here's what God says. This beast is going to be able to perform miracles. Now watch this. There is a difference between what we've previously read and Revelation 13, and here's the difference. The miracles that were done before that we read, the children of, of God, the men of God by Jesus himself, they were all miracles for God. What's the devil going to do? He's going to do miracles against God. Are you listening? The devil has power. You say... How do I know if someone is on the devil's side instead of on God's side? Well, it's pretty easy. The Bible says you can tell them by their fruit. Are they against this book? Are they against church? Are they against Jesus Christ himself, like the name Jesus Christ? Well, I don't care if they can do miracles or not. If they're against God and the things of God, that means they're of the devil. And here the Antichrist, he's going to be able to perform miracles. 
And he's going to get people to worship the beast and worship him and, 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 and take the number 666. And if you don't take it, you won't be able to buy and trade. You won't be able to go to Walmart and buy groceries. That's what that means. And then he says, we're going to kill you too. Now, just because someone can perform miracles doesn't mean they are of God. You've got to be careful not to be deceived. Miracles do exist. There never has been a day and age which miracles ceased. And God is able to do miracles. We got to make sure we're not doing evil. We got to make sure we're in obedience to God. And then we need to be full of faith and full of power. And we can see God do miracles in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us.